as we continue to Easter, we're looking at the different acts of Jesus, what the different events in the life of Jesus. The I-O-Ns is kind of how the suffix that I've talked about, the, uh, the, the, the resurrection, the crucifixion, the temptation, the transfiguration, the incarnation, the I-O-Ns of Jesus, of, of what happened in his life, because we're moving from belief to reality. Most people... They believe in Jesus, and then they kind of figure out more and more who this Jesus is. Now, there are times when individuals have, um, they, they said, well, I've heard about this Jesus, and so I'm going to start researching this Jesus, and then I believe in Jesus. But even if you've researched Jesus extensively, you still have more to learn. And so we believe in this Jesus. We're trying to figure out more and more who he is and what this looks like trying to figure out when Jesus asked Peter in Matthew chapter 16, who do people say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does that mean? And what does it mean when Jesus says in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what we're looking at. That's where we're moving on to. And we're, going to be, we're in the Gospel of Luke. All right, we're in Luke chapter 3 today. Uh, we're in the Gospel of Luke, and, and we're going to continue into Acts eventually in this series because Luke traditionally is the author of, of both Luke and Acts. And so we're looking at how Luke portrays Jesus and these different, different uh, acts of Jesus. And so we're in Luke chapter 3, starting verse 21, we're 21 and 22. So we're not going to get there yet, but, but you, can, you can put a bookmark or your finger there. And uh, just two verses, the, the baptism of Jesus is a relatively short section. There's stuff before and, and before and in context as well. But we're looking at baptism today. And you said, well, hold on. You're talking about the ions of Jesus. There's no, that, that, that word doesn't end ion. Well, I could have gotten cute. We could have talked about the affirmation of Jesus or the immersion of Jesus. Um, but, I, but personally, I, I hope you can give me grace with that. Of, we're talking about the baptism. And I, uh, at some point, pastors do have limits on the cuteness they use with the you know, three points of sermons, the alliterations, all those types of things. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we're talking about the baptism of Jesus and what that looks like and what that means. And so as we think of baptism, the first question we ask is, what is baptism? And we may know w- what the actual act of baptism is, but baptism is a sacrament, which then we have to ask, what is a sacrament? A sacrament is an outward sign of inward grace. And so we think of something like baptism. Water is the outward sign. It's the worldly sign. It's the thing we have that points to the work that Jesus is doing inside the person being baptized. So with baptism, when you go into the water, the water is the sign of the grace that God is giving you. And so that is a sacrament. And baptism is one of the sacraments in the Church of the Nazarene. We have two sacraments. We have baptism, and then we have communion. Communion can also be called the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. But communion is where we take the cup and the bread and the body and blood of Christ and we partake of that in remembrance of Jesus. Now, other traditions have other sacraments. So, for instance, the Catholic tradition has seven sacraments. As far as I know, all of them have, all Christian traditions have baptism and communion. But Catholics also have, have five additional ones. They have confirmation, which is, is typically, if you grew up in the church, Sometime around middle school, 7th, 8th grade, you go through a catechism class, learn doctrines of the church, and then you are essentially initiated into the church, welcomed into the church, a member, you're confirmed into the church. And then we have penance or confession, where you confess your sins to, and the Catholic church would be the priest. We have anointing of the sick, which in, in a lot of ways used to be limited to last rites, of uh, somebody was giving a blessing just before they were passing when they're on their deathbed. But anointing the sick can also be included in that. And so, but there are two that you can only experience one of them. So in the Catholic Church, you can only experience six of the seven because there's ordination and there's matrimony. And if you are a priest, you cannot be married. And if you're married, you cannot be a priest. And so you can only partake in six of the seven of the actual sacraments. Now, some traditions have three. So they have communion and, and baptism, and they have a third one called foot washing. 
in which they wash each other's feet. And the reason for having those three is that these were three things Jesus did. Jesus was baptized, Jesus initiated communion, the Last Supper, and Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And, and so th those, are, those are the kind of the, the outliers, or the, the, the not outliers, the, um, the different types of sacraments that different traditions have. But most Protestant churches have, have uh, baptism and communion. Those are the ones that, that most are more familiar with. But what happens with baptism? But I think Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 can provide great insight for us of what happens at baptism. Apostle Paul's writing says, Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And so what Paul is saying here is when someone is baptized, what's happening is when you go under the water, when you are immersed, you are joining Jesus in his death. And so when you rise out of the water, you are now joining Jesus in his resurrection. You die to your old life and you are raised to a new life. Now this imagery, I think, really works when we're talking about rivers. Because most of the, has anybody baptized in a river? Has anyone? Just, just, a, just a few. Um, we, don't, we don't like that anymore, right? We've got to have clean, sanitary places. But the, uh, um, the rivers showed that, that you, you, were, you were immersed, you went under the water, and the water washed away your old life, and you emerged a new person, your old life being washed away, never to be seen again. And so, so that's the imagery of what's happening. We die with Jesus, and then we're raised to Jesus in new life. Now, in the church, we have this phrase. We don't use it all that often, but it's a phrase that the Holy Spirit bears witness. Um, again, that's, that's not a, a phrase we use all the time. But let's go to Acts chapter 2 with Peter. He says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when I said the Holy Spirit bears witness, that when we are baptized, the Holy Spirit makes this a meaningful event, a meaningful experience. Now, some of you maybe remember your baptism very vividly and how you felt. And, and the Holy Spirit is part of that. Because now sometimes how we feel our emotions, sometimes it's the Holy Spirit that, that is doing a work in us, sometimes it's the Holy Spirit working on our emotions. I'm not trying to downplay our emotions, but make sure we don't say emotions of the Holy Spirit are always the same thing. But the Holy Spirit shows up in baptism and makes evidence what's happening is meaningful, has value, and is worth doing. But when we think of baptism, a question we have to ask is, is why are certain sacraments different in our practices? So, so because um, in our church, we take communion once a month. Some, some churches take communion a few times a year. Some take it every week. Some have it available every day if you want to go partake in it. Well, we take communion once a month, but we're only baptized once. Why don't, why don't we go jump back in the baptistry every month? Why don't, why don't we do that? Outside of the inconvenience, let's take out the inconvenience factor, okay? Right, because you you're wet, and then you're going to dry off, and it's hard, and, and all that. But Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 5 specifically, says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so the question then is, well, do I have to be rebaptized? So we talk about, you know, you only need to be baptized one time. Um... So we have a couple scenarios that can typically happen. One is that someone was baptized as an infant, and then as they become a teenager, adult, however old, they feel they need to be rebaptized. The other instance is somebody was baptized and then decided to walk away from Jesus, and then they came back to Jesus and said, I want to be rebaptized. Now, from a theological perspective, we don't need to be rebaptized. One baptism is all that Scripture actually says we need. Because what happens is God's grace does not expire. And that's great news for us, right? It's not as though, well, I've got to get baptized every 10 years or so, or every year, or, or I've got to get, get, get re-dunked again. I, 
that, that's not theologically how it works. Now, now, experientially, maybe you need something like that. But from a theological perspective, we don't. We just need to reaffirm the baptism we have already received. So I, I was baptized when I was 19. I'll tell that story here in a little bit. But it's not as though that baptism is ever going to go bad. I can choose to reject it. I can choose to run away from the baptism that God has given me. And if I do, all I need to do is come back and receive it and accept it again. Now, I think sometimes we kind of combine a couple of different concepts that make this difficult for us. So we can come to the, the, uh, the concept of, of marriage. And certain traditions have marriage as a sacrament. And so you who are married, it is not required that you remarry your spouse. It's not required. Now, if you want to renew your vows, that can be a great, meaningful experience. But it's not required that you actually remarry your spouse, go through the sacrament again, I guess you could say. But from our society standpoint, you can actually go and legally separate yourself from your spouse and be divorced. And then from the legal standpoint, in order to be married to that person again, you have to then get remarried. That's not how Jesus works. It's not as though Jesus says, well, you got to go through all the ritual again. You just have to accept and receive and affirm that which you've already been given. So, so that, that's from, again, we're talking about the theological perspective, maybe not the experiential part of, of baptism and what that, that, that means, because God's grace does not expire. And we have to make sure we allow that to sink into our lives. No matter what you're going through, no matter how valuable you think you are, no matter the worth you think you have, God's grace does not expire. Now, now with this, um, and I think we know this, and I would probably be tempted to do the same thing, but the location of your baptism does not actually matter. Now, I asked who was baptized in the river, a little tongue-in-cheek situation with that. The location of your baptism doesn't matter. I know people who have gone to the Holy Land, and they were baptized in the Jordan River because Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, right? God's grace is not dependent upon your geographical location. Uh, and and so, so this is about God's grace. And we, when we make sure we recognize it's the outward sign, the water is the outward sign of what God is doing in us. It's about God's work. And so regardless of the content of the water, it's God's grace that's doing a work in us. And, and so because we're focused so much on the grace and the Church of Nazarene specifically, we can be baptized in three different ways. The most common one is immersion. Where, where you literally submerge completely under the water and then you come out. Whether you do it in a baptistry like this, whether you do it in, in a pool, in a lake, in a river, wherever, it's you're fully immersed and you come out. The second way is, is pouring. And, and pouring is done for, for many reasons. Maybe someone doesn't have access to a baptistry or, or water. Um, a lot of times when infants are baptized, they kind of have hold the infant over a, a basin and they pour water over the, the crown of the infant's head. And so they, they pour like that. Usually for adults, just in case this ever comes up for you, um, pouring is not like a four ounce glass of water. It's a pitcher. So if your, excuse, if your reason to be poured is because you don't want to get wet, you're still going to get wet. <laughs> Just had some experience with that before. But, uh, and, and there are reasons that may be the appropriate response. Um, I was part of a, a baptismal service where it was in an above-ground pool. Didn't have a, it, there was no deck, so the person had to climb up the ladder and then back down. And the person was not physically able to do that. Her, her age prevented her from being comfortable doing it. So we poured. And what a great, meaningful experience the third, third um, way is sprinkling, and it's where the minister dips hands in water and sprinkles the individual. This is commonly uh, done in, in places like, it can be done for infants, but if there's a, a shut-in situation or a person uh, who's bedridden and unable to get up, this would be a, a typical reason for this. But remember, the water is the outward sign. 
The water is, is, is not the, the pivotal thing happening here. It's the grace of Jesus that is coming into our lives that is making the difference. And so we have things like infant baptism, which is not something we see super a lot in the church of the Nazarene. Some of you grew up in traditions where, well, yeah, you, you get baptized when you're an infant. That's what we do. Some of you grew up in traditions where they didn't. And so it's, it's, it's always interesting in the sense of if you grew up in a tradition, you're like, well, yeah, what, what, why wouldn't we? And if you grew up in a tradition where you don't, you're like, well, why wouldn't you? Um, and so, but, but the, from, from a theological perspective, it can work. And we have Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is the Shema. And it gives parents the spiritual responsibility and authority over their kids. And saying, again, as you are going, talk about God. As you're standing up, as you're sitting down, as you're at home, as you're traveling, talk about God and talk about the responsibility of parents for their children. And so when you have an infant, the children, child cannot make decisions for themselves, so the spirit, parents are spiritually responsible for them. But see, what has to happen is that child has to accept and affirm the baptism its parents chose for them. That, that's an important step on our spiritual journey with Jesus, that if we are baptized a long time ago, if we don't remember it, or if, uh, uh, even if, if, if we do remember it, you know, we have to accept that baptism. We have to receive it. And this is where things like confirmation really come into play in some of these churches because it's their public affirmation of, I want to follow Jesus. Because a lot of times as adults, that's what baptism becomes for us. It's a public saying, hey, you know, I want to follow this Jesus. I want to tell people that I want to follow Jesus. And so we need that component. But I think part of the, the, the biggest question we may have to ask ourselves, is baptism necessary to be saved? And, and, and we, can, we can walk through this, and, and the, the, the clearest, it's a, it's a, the answer is no but. Okay, I don't want to bear the lead. The answer is no but. The answer is no in part because we can see uh, and in Luke chapter uh, 22, when Jesus is on the cross, sorry, it's, I think it's 23. Uh, no, it's chapter 22, I'm sorry. Um, where the thief is on the cross, one, or two, one, one, set, one rebukes Jesus and, and ridicules him. The other one says, hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. So we know that individual was not baptized. So it seems as though baptism doesn't necessarily have to happen. But I say, but... But Jesus commanded us to be baptized. And so if we're not, we, we ought to have a pretty good reason not to be baptized. I think the thief on the cross has a pretty good reason for not being baptized. I think we can agree to that. But Jesus commands us to do this, and he tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He calls us to make, bat, uh, make disciples and baptize. That's what we are called to do. Peter said in Acts 2, repent and be baptized. That's what we are called to do. We're called to believe in Jesus and then be part of the sacrament that he has called us to do. And, and, and as we think about about Jesus. We're going to get to Luke chapter 3 here in just a moment. But before we get to the actual baptism of Jesus, we have John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist was a relative of Jesus, and he was doing ministry. In, in, in Luke chapter 3, the beginning part is John is doing ministry. He's out in the wilderness. He's, he's eating his honey and his locusts. He's got his camel fur, and he's got this great message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he's baptizing individuals. But he tells the crowd, those who are gathered, it's in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, he says, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. John says, I'm going to baptize you with water, but there's one who's coming who's going to baptize you with something that's crazy more. Like, it's just so much more that it's crazy. John's not even worthy to be the lowest servant to untie the sandals of Jesus. Now, I have zero interest to take your shoes and socks off or put your shoes and socks on. 
But our hygiene is a lot different than they were in the days of Jesus. And, and what John is alluding to is the lowest servant in the household was responsible for doing these types of tasks. And John is saying, I'm not even worthy to be the lowest servant of this one who is to come, which is Jesus. That's how much greater John identifies Jesus as him. Now remember, Jesus later in the gospel says, there's of those born of women, there is none greater than John. So John is greater than everybody else, but he's not even good enough to be the lowest servant of Jesus. And this baptism that Jesus will provide, it's baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's a transformational moment. Because we look at the life of Jesus, and there are many miracles that Jesus performed. He healed individuals. He set them free from their infirmities, but those were temporary miracles of Jesus. He came to do something more than just heal us temporarily. He came to free us for all of eternity. He came to free us from anything that which binds. That's what he came for. But we come to Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22 to see Jesus' baptism. It says, one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. That's the extent of the baptism of Jesus. There's, again, there's context before and there's things that happen afterwards. But John the Baptist, he was baptizing those individuals that came to him. There were people that crowds had gathered for whatever reason. They were drawn to the message that John was giving. He was calling them to repent and then he was baptizing them. Now other gospels, Matthew and Mark, have other details that they include. And, and some of those details are the fact that John the Baptist was hesitant to baptize Jesus. When Jesus came to John and said, I want you to baptize me, John said, whoa, 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 whoa. I've already told these people that the one who's coming after me, that person's baptism is going to be greater than mine. I can't baptize you. I need you to baptize me. That's what, what John said. He was hesitant to do it. But John eventually submitted to Jesus. Now, Luke's account doesn't actually go into this, doesn't give us um, uh, any context for this. But, but John submitted to Jesus and he baptized Jesus. And, and it, a question we can consider is, well, why was Jesus baptized? Part of baptism is repentance. We're dying to our old life. We're dying to our sin. We're recognizing the forgiveness that Jesus has forgiven us. Well, Jesus didn't need to repent. He didn't need to change because he lived a life without sin. But what his baptism does is it shows his willingness to submit to the Father, even in the small details. Because we know he didn't sin. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus' baptism, part of what it does is it helps him identify with humanity. It's a way that Jesus says, I identify with you. I know what you're going through. I'm go I've gone through the things that you are going through. I have lived a life like you. Jesus identifies with us because he came to save us. He did so willingly, knowing it would cost him dearly. But when we look at Jesus, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus makes baptism meaningful. If the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus did not happen, then baptism is meaningless. If the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus did not happen, then us following Jesus is meaningless. But because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, all these things have value. See, Jesus did not need to re baptism to repent. It was his way of submitting to the mission that he had been given. But what his baptism does is that it inaugurates his public ministry. Because after this, Jesus gets ready to do ministry. After this, Jesus starts fulfilling the mission that God has given him. 
Remember, we have, this, we have a big gap in some of the life of Jesus. He was born, and we had this great moment of, of Jesus born. Now, now, we do find that Jesus was in the temple when he was around 12 years old. There's one reference to that. Outside of that, we have really nothing between Jesus as a toddler and Jesus as a 30-year-old doing ministry. So what, we don't know what's happening, but this baptism is Jesus' reintroduction back into the public, and he is getting ready to do ministry. It's his public ministry, the inauguration of that. So he identifies with fallen humanity and is getting ready to start his public ministry. Now, this moment, um, this baptism of Jesus, part of what happens here is we see the Trinity at play. Our understanding of God as Father of Jesus is we have one God and three persons. One God and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we see all three that are represented here. But we think of the Father and the Son. So Jesus is God the Son, and God the Father is the typical one when we think of the concept of God that typically comes to mind, the creator, and, and those things come to mind. But God, the, the terms father and son are how they relate to each other. But both are eternal. God is eternal, so God the son is eternal. God the father is eternal. God the Holy Spirit is eternal. Commonly, when we talk about God the father and God the son, we think of, of terms of our humanness. Of There was a time where I was not a father, but, there's a time, but I am now a father. God the Father always was God the Father. God the Son always was God the Son. And so the Son is eternal and the Father is eternal. It's not as though the Father birthed another deity, per se, and merged into one. And so, but we see the Trinity is at play here and that all members are present. And so in this moment, the heavens are open. Now, I don't really know what that means. My, my typical understanding, my imagery, is that like the clouds parted and the sun shone through. Right? We've seen that in real life. We've seen how movies can play on that, of all of a sudden there's a light that happens. That's the imagery that we, at least I come up with, not, not as though that's actually identified here. But there is some some concepts I think that are, are important in the sense of when we talk about the heavens closing, that's usually a bad thing. Usually there's no rain, so there's famine, or the blessing of God is absent. So when the heavens are open, there's, there's abundant crops, there's plenty, there's goodness, there's blessings that are flowing. And so in part, we see that the blessings from God are flowing down because the heavens are open. And in this, the Father the Holy Spirit descended, and the Father uh, affirmed His Son. The Father said, You are my beloved Son, and you bring me great joy. The Father affirms the Son in this moment. But when we think about God, there is no subordination. Instead of subordination, there's mutual submission. So it's not as though God the Father is in charge, and the Son and the Holy Spirit are kind of get, get in line, or 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 anything. Else. There's no power struggle because they mutually submit. And one of the great things about God is that God invites us to participate with Him. God invites us to a relationship with Him, and then He calls us to have the same relationship with others. He calls us to be one. He calls us to mutually submit to each other. That's what God calls us to do, and who He is is how He calls us to live. But there's acceptance and there's love embedded within the nature of who God is. But Jesus understands that in order to get to God, we have to go through him. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And it's not as though Jesus is trying to bulldoze us or put us in a corner. Jesus is making it possible so that we can get through the Father. He's not just saying that is the way. He's saying he's embodying the way. He said, come with me. If you come with me, you will get to the Father because Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. Through Jesus, we see God in the fullest extent. Jesus shows that God is not some foreign, distant deity who wants nothing to do with us. He comes to us. He makes God known. The baptism of Jesus shows 
that he is willing to submit. It shows he, he is willing to accept his calling to restore us to God. So, as I said, you don't have to be saved in order to get to heaven, but Jesus shows what it looks like to be obedient to God. He shows us what it looks like to submit to the Father, because Jesus didn't need to be baptized. From a repentance standpoint, Jesus didn't need that. He didn't need to die to his old self because he was already living in the new life that God calls us to live because he'd been tempted in every way, yet he was without sin. He came to restore us. He came to restore us to the Father. But the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus make baptism meaningful. Make it something that is theologically significant for us. Makes it something that can be emotionally significant for us. See, I was not baptized until I was 19. I grew up in the church. And uh, there are a few reasons why I wasn't baptized earlier. In part, we had a pastoral transition, and things kind of fell through the cracks a little bit. But in the Church of Nazarene, in order to get the process of, uh, process of ordination starts with what's called a local minister's license, where the church board issues a local minister's license to one of their members who feels they have a call to ministry. And, and really, that doesn't come with any... There's nothing that really comes with that. You can't do anything extra or special. It's a matter of, it's just part of the process of making sure that people are investing in those who feel they're called to ministry. So I was 19, coming home over summer from my college break, and I was talking to my pastor about not being baptized. Um, he had given me a local license through the church board, and we talked about baptism. We had it set up, and he asked me... Um, if I wanted to help with the baptisms that he was doing that day. And I told him, I said, I, I, I can't really help until I've been baptized. So I went first that day in order so that I could help the pastor baptize the other, and other individuals. In part, he was inviting me to participate in what he was doing. He was inviting me to be part of that, which is a privilege. And so, so it was just a, a, a powerful moment for me. And I remember I was baptized in the Church of Christ in Potomac, Illinois, because that was the, we had, there were three churches in town. One of them had a baptistry. So it was a Sunday afternoon on that day, and we were baptized there. Um, and uh, there were several of us that were baptized in that time there at the Church of Christ. So I want to challenge you today. If you have not been baptized, I want to challenge you to say, well, is Jesus calling me to be baptized? I mean, Jesus commands us to. I mean, but that's between you and Jesus. If a preacher guilts you into being baptized, that's probably not the healthy way to go about being baptized. Now, if the Holy Spirit convicts you to be baptized, that's a whole different conversation. But the fact of the matter, I want to challenge you to do that because you don't have to be baptized to get into heaven, but Jesus commands us to, so we need to submit to Jesus. We need to listen to Jesus. That's what baptism is impartially about. I'm submitting to Jesus. I am dying to my old life and being raised new life in Jesus. But you know one of the great things is that every once in a while, you can do this all the time if you want, but at least every once in a while to reaffirm the baptism that you have received, to reaffirm the grace that God has given you. That's what we need to do. So every time somebody is baptized, it's a public moment where you who are not being baptized get to affirm this individual, but you also get to reaffirm the baptism that Jesus has given you. You get to reaffirm the grace that you have already been given. Jesus shows us what it means to submit to the Father. He shows us what it means to accept the calling that we have received. So wherever you are, if you've been baptized, I hope today has been an affirmation of the grace that God has poured out in your life. If you haven't, I hope you prayerfully consider what does it mean to be baptized? What would that look like for me to do? It's a command from Jesus, but it's part of the community. 
You see, our, our issue here is that we, we learn a lesson. It's not that we check off a box that I was present. It's not that we perform these religious rituals. Our purpose today is we're seeking Jesus. But you know, when we seek Jesus, what happens? Heaven begins to break into our world. Heaven begins to change things. Heaven begins to make a difference in our lives. Heaven begins to show up in real and tangible ways. So every time we're baptized, you know what? Maybe the heavens open just a little bit more. But you know, every time we reaffirm and re-receive the baptism that Jesus has given us, heavens can open just a little bit more more. 